So I welcome everybody to tonight's talk by Jacqueline Van Sant on Austria made in Hollywood. Um, Jacqueline Van Sant is Professor Emerita of German at the University of Michigan Dearborn. And she's very recently retired, but I realized perhaps just as busy with teaching and research. So I'm even more grateful that Jacqueline agreed to give this online talk this evening. Jacqueline's research I have followed over the decades is connected to Austrian culture and history in many ways. Her dissertation, Against the Horizon, Feminism and Post-War Austrian Women's right, Women Writers, was on feminism and Austrian women writers in the Second Republic. She is also the author of Reclaiming Heimat, Trauma, Trauma and Mourning in Memoirs by Jewish-Austrian Remigres, who came back to Austria. And she is currently working on an edition of a correspondence she found between Jewish-Austrian classmates between 38 and 53, which, which sounds fascinating. And Jacqueline recently gave a paper, still in person here at the IMLR, on mapping trauma in Ilse Eichinger's Die Größere Hoffnung through film and film language. Eichinger also wrote marvelously about film herself, very often American movies of the golden era. And tonight, this is kind of the opposite, or it's connected. Jacqueline will tell us about her most recent book, Austria Made in Hollywood, where she reanalyzes Austrian settings in over 60 Hollywood films by well-known directors like Erich von Stroheim, Billy Wilder, Michael Curtis, and many lesser known ones or forgotten ones. She analyzes the films as cultural artifacts fueled by both nostalgia and responses to historical cesuras and as refractions of American concerns relating to class and ethnicity. Um, before Jacqueline starts, just the, the, the the housekeeping general, please uh, mute yourself and turn off your cameras while she speaks. But in the Q&A, please, you're very welcome to, to, to raise your hand and speak to make yourself visible. It makes it just so much more lively. Or if you prefer, you can write with the chat function and I'll read any questions. Be aware that it will be recorded. So by speaking, you give your consent that you are recorded. Um, so Jacqueline, welcome and over to you. Okay, so thank you so much for this invitation. It's such a delight to be able to talk about um, this fun topic. When I gave a talk in 1994 on The Third Man and the Sound of Music, I had no intention of writing a book on Hollywood's images of Austria. But one thing led to another. And when I embarked on the, the project, I was amazed at the number of Hollywood films that were set in Austria. And I don't expect you to read the, the names, but this is just um, the list I came up with. Since 1923, when Erich von Stroheim introduced Vienna to moviegoers with merry-go-round, Hollywood studios, ha, studios have produced over 50 um, Austria films. A very diverse group, Hollywood's Austria films include examples from almost every imaginable genre. They're dramas, melodramas, farces, comedies, costume dramas, biographical pictures, musicals and operettas. And the sources are just as varied. Short stories, novels, novellas, plays, musicals, and operettas have been turned into Hollywood's Austria. There have been remakes of both foreign and domestic films. Both major and minor studios set in, um, made films set in Austria, and they've produced extravagant A productions as well as B, um, obvious B fillers. They've had critical and financial successes there have been flops and financial disasters among these films. Despite this variety, the, the films fall in easily into two categories. Those are um, the first category, films that take place in an Austria identifiable through landmarks, historical personalities, and events. And then those films where the Austrian locale is merely signaled by a label or through dialogue or stock um, footage. The film story could have easily been set elsewhere without impacting on the story. In my book, I focus on the first group, that is those films set in an identifiable Austria. In these many Austria films, Austria resembles reflections in a, a funhouse mirror. The elements of the distortions tie the stories to a real place, a real time, and its people, yet there is a significant gap between the reality and filmic um, portrayals. Yeah, but nonetheless, these films have contributed to the public's perception 
of the country and its citizens. Perhaps the best example is the sound of music. Uh, many Americans are convinced that Edelweiss is the national anthem and that the Austrian population um, opposed national socialism, national socialism. From the least commercially successful movie to box office hits, Hollywood's Austria has much to tell us. Set in an imagined Austria, tied to American fantasies and shaped by an American reality, the films contain multiple messages. On the one hand, the movies impart limited information about Austria or Austria-Hungary and its citizenry. At the same time, the choice of settings in the fractured Austrian history reveal much about the relationship between the domestic film industry and historical context in the United States. The films contain narratives on changing American mores and gender relationships, as well as shifting American attitudes toward foreigners and foreign policy. The differing, differing industry practices and divergent mores, as well as audience expectations that shape these films speak to the importance of the cultural context. So the structure of my talk, I will, will first give a rough and speedy overview of Hollywood's Austria films. Um, I'll highlight the major factors and shifts in the industry that contributed to the appearance and evolution of Austria or Austria-Hungary on the Hollywood stage. Then I'll turn to specific examples from three of my chapters. When first introduced to the Hollywood screen in the 20s, films played off pre-existing notions of Vienna that were circulating in the United States. Considered the capital of gaiety long before World War I, both the decadence of the crumbling empire and its inhabitants and its Ceylon were captured in films that were set in the last years of the monarchy. The stories told often dealt with racy topics and the behaviors of the, Aust the behavior of the Austrians would have been deemed inappropriate for Americans. Other silent movies of the period set in post-war Austria appealed to audiences' nostalgia for the once glorious city, and they looked sympathetically upon those whose world had been shattered by the war. The introduction of sound in the late 20s, the onset of the depression, and the institution of the motion pictures production code brought about the evolution of earlier scenarios. I, and I would say the singular most important and lasting influence on the shape of Hollywood's Austria was the introduction of sound in the late 20s. This cemented the use of Austria's musical heritage, both as an identifying factor and subject of films. This, um, ever since the waltz has been repeatedly used to signal the location of films and uh, historical and fictional Austrian composers were introduced to the Hollywood screen. And then all the four films that were shown here, uh, music plays a very important role. Ramon Navarro in both of the films is the singing hero and the, the um, Evelyn May Lay and then um, Grace Moore and um, both stars of Champagne Waltz are musicians. Okay. In the late 30s and 40s, filmmakers drew on these earlier cliches to show that Austria was different from Nazi Germany. Emperor Franz Josef, Austrian composers that Strauss and, and um, Schubert, and Lippitzaner appeared in films that distanced Austria from Germany, while at the still time fulfilling the industry's in, um, entertainment imperative. And only rarely did films present the Anschluss on, on screen. In these three films, the Anschluss and its consequences carry with them different messages from sympathy for the refugees to the need to enter the war, and finally to the justification for having entered the war. Perhaps um, one of the oddest films, The Strange Death of Adolf Hitler, is one of two films that show post-Anschluss Austria. And these two films are both from, from 1943. And in these films, the importance of resistance is underscored. When an identifiable Austria was resurrected in the first films on the post-war screen, the disparate films added to the um, thematic repertoire. In 1948, Max Ofus brought the Austrian author Stefan Zweig's Letter from an Unknown Woman to the screen. Billy Wilder made fun of Hollywood's Austria in his less serious confection, The Emperor Waltz. And in 1950, MGM released The Red Danube, the first post-war films set in a more contemporary Austria, which focused on the plight of refugees who are repatriated to East Bloc countries in a divided Austria with a definite anti-Soviet message. 
And I see the Red Danube as sort of a poor cousin to Carol Reed's The Third Man. 10 years would pass before Hollywood produced the next film with an Austrian setting. In the 60s, the financial advantages of filming on location brought about a mini Austrian film renaissance. Such films fed on the growing tourist industry. And perhaps the best known of the best example is The Sound of Music. In the wake of um, the Americans seeing the film, the American tourism to Salzburg skyrocketed. Studios also found themselves faced with another enemy, that is television, and they were hoping to lure audiences back into the theaters with foreign backdrops. So John Huston's Freud and Otto Preminger's The Cardinal offered fair with more, uh, for more sophisticated adult audiences with an um, Austrian background, and Disney and 20th Century Fox sought the family-oriented audiences with the story of the White Stallions, the um, Sanger Knaben, and the Trap family. In the following decade, filmmakers turned to Austrian stories shot on location with variety, with varying success. In the subsequent years, um, film feature films set in Austria have been few and far between. Three notable films provide unique takes on the episodes on episodes from free, pre-1918 Austria. We have Milos Forman's Amadeus and Bernhard Rose's Immortal Beloved. They're both set in Austria, although filmed in the Czech Republic. They both tap into Austria's pre-World War I musical heritage with their unique perspectives on Mozart and Beethoven, respectively. Neil Berger's The Illusionist invents um, an evil crown prince, not Rudolf, who wants to murder his father, the Emperor Franz Josef. And the film fractures Austrian history in ways that imply how distant this historical period has become for most viewers. Most recently, um, Terence Malick has turned to a darker page in Austria's history with a hidden life. The film tells the story of the Austrian um, Franz Jägerstetter, a conscientious objector who refuses to fight the Nazis in World War I and pays with his life. The, over the years, contemporary Austria nestled between Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Yugoslavia has shown up in an as an incidental, incident, incidental, excuse me, incidental part of any number of action and spy movies. And in these films, the Austrian setting serves merely as an attractive background for the film's whirlwind tour. These four way, forays into Austria hardly engage with the um, country's citizenship, citizenry, its history, or current state of affairs. So after that whirlwind tour, we're gonna to turn to um, examples from three chapters in my book. And the first chapter is um, entitled, The Empire Strikes Back, Imperial Austria Fights Nazis. And I focus on um, these three films. Before the United States declared war on Germany in December, 1941, Hollywood was reluctant to produce anti-Nazi films. The studios feared, feared alienating German audiences and producing films openly critical of the Third Reich also posed numerous domestic challenges. Moviegoers seemed particularly skeptical of an industry that had painted the Germans in stark black and white terms during World War I. And consequently, a large portion of the population found the reported brutality of the Germans and the Nazi regime hard to believe. And also the widespread um, isolational sentiments in Congress and among the American population must have been discouraging for politically minded anti-fascist filmmakers. The United States' involvement in World War I and the disintegration of hopes for peace had fed the desires among Americans of all political stripes to stay out of European affairs. And before the United States entered World War II, the film industry executives were also concerned that any expressly political movie might run counter um, to the United States policy of neutrality. But these stories set in Imperial Austria provided the opportunity to attack German politics by proxy Stories with Austrian roots that were seemingly far removed from contemporary events would ideally attract a diverse audience in both the United States and abroad. And at the same time, they could convey hidden messages. Johann Strauss, Jr., um, Franz Schubert, and the Lipitzaner, along with the Emperor Franz Josef, are used to comment on contemporary situations. Now, I want to focus on um, one film, The Great Waltz, and particularly the end sequences from the end of The Great Waltz. 
In November of 1938, MGM released a Johann Strauss biopic, um, The Great Walls. The first um, scene that I want to show you, which as I mentioned is toward the end of the film, ties the music of Strauss both to Austria and the world. Strauss has um, just broken off his fair affair with the opera singer Carla Donner, Donner, and rather than running off with her to Budapest, he remains in Vienna. And after he's broken, her, broken this off, he finds himself um, sitting alongside of the Danube. So in the film, the composition of the Blue Danube Waltz, which we're going to see it's sort of its birth, is tied very much to its birthplace, Austria. But as you'll see, the music appeals to a worldwide audience. So let's... The, um, the scenes from Austria tie the waltz clearly to place, but at the same time, the multiple language editions of the piece, the huge orchestras, the image of the globe and the dancing pairs from around the world unite Strauss with international audiences and distance Austria from its aggressor. And the next scene that I'm gonna talk about comes at the um, right after this one. And if you notice, there was a younger Strauss at the very beginning of this uh, sequence and the Strauss you see now is much older. This is, um, so the, the sequence places us at the end of it in front of Schönbrunn in 1888, when both are old men, um, Strauss and the emperor. In this film, Johann Strauss and um, Franz Josef have met twice, once during the revolution, before Franz Josef had become emer emperor, and then again, 43 years later as old men. When Johann Strauss and Franz Josef met for the first time, the two men represent different sides of the upheaval. But um, how they were ultimately both seen as opposing tyranny. Although Strauss supports the revolution, he's presented somewhat as, an, as a revolutionary, not able to articulate his oppressed position. And at the same time, Franz Josef is seen as the one who introduced the new constitution, and he becomes somewhat illogically a hero of the revolution. As such, the stage is set for the reconciliation of the two um, many years later. The elderly Strauss has been called to court to meet with the aged emperor. A much humbler Strauss meets the emperor who poo-poos the composer's uh, formality and reminds him of their first meeting when Strauss called the emperor a stuffed shirt. And um, the emperor admits that he was indeed a stuffed shirt. And, but now he wants to show Strauss how um, famous he is and how he is. He calls him the king of Vienna and he presents him at the very end of the film to cheering crowds of Austria when he leads him on to the balcony. And this is the clip of that. So viewed against the background of the historical events of 1983, the reconciliation between the two icons of Austrian identity takes on contemporary significance. In November, 1938, when the Great Waltz was released, the imaginary meeting of the venerated Emperor Franz Josef and the celebrated composer, Johann Strauss Jr., on the balcony of Schönbrunn with cheering crowds of Austrian serves as a counter image to the crowds that welcomed Hitler at the Hofburg in March of 1938. Moreover, it points to the hope of a political reconciliation between the left and right and suggests the belief that the people's love for Austria will win out. Um, and we know that it doesn't, and the next two films in this chapter take that up, but that I will skip now and move on to the next chapter that I want to talk about um, briefly, Reflections and Refractions of the Anschluss on the Screen that were made in 1941 and 1942. So Ends Our Night and They Dare Not Love were made before December of 1941, and The Once Upon a Honeymoon was made in 42. At the time of the Anschluss, Americans may have read about it in the newspapers, heard live radio reports from foreign correspondents such as Edward Murrow, or seen newsreel footage, but nonetheless, the Anschluss remained a distant event for many Americans. Moreover, American audiences seemed reluctant to attend pictures dealing with national socialist threat, the threat in the United States or abroad. In addition, directly addressing the European situation before December 1941 could turn out to be uh, more than just a poor investment. In short-lived Senate hearings in late summer and fall of 1941, both So Ends Our Night and They Dare Not Love came under scrutiny. Although the demise of Austria as a sovereign state did not lack drama, translating its uh, political significance for Americans after the fact was not an easy task. 
And I'm going to focus on um, the Anschluss scene in one uh, film, They Dare Not Love, which in odd ways anticipates um, the sound of music. So They Dare Not Love is a unhappy combination of a love story, a um, cross-class love story, a thriller, and a drama. Columbia's They Dare Not Love begins with a fractured dramatization of the Anschluss. With its strange mix of fact and fiction, the film is introduced in a documentary style with credits, shown over the backdrop of the Habsburg double-headed eagle. And um, then they, the credits disappear. So after this not so subtle suggestion that the story might take place in Austria-Hungary, the screen goes black and text appears that zeroes in more specifically on place and time. And it reads, Vienna, on that tragic day that saw fury unleashed, a fury that was to crush peoples and nations in the ruthless drive to conquer the world, Austria was first, end of quote. The date, March 11th, 1938, is then splashed dramatically across the screen, locating the action more exactly um, temporally. With the ultimate goal of arguing the necessity of the war, the filmmakers draw on and reproduce filmic cliches from previous imperial movies. Moreover, Austria's victim status is repeatedly substantiated. The introductory 11 minutes set, Austria, um, set in Austria combine a curious reenactment of the Anschluss with an even stranger presentation of its public announcement to a group of Austrians. In order to eliminate any sign of public acceptance of the Anschluss, the dare, They Dare Not Love includes no um, newsreel footage, which is very different from the other two films. Rather, it presents the annexation of Austria as a clandestine takeover of, um, front by the Germans. So after the date, March 11, 1938, disappears from the screen, the camera focuses on feet and torsos. The first set of feet meets up with the second set, and some and there are some mysterious hand gestures. Um, and this happens a couple times before the, uh, the men go into a, wind, a door, and then the camera pans up to the door, which is the German Travel Bureau. So it's very clear that it's the Germans who are um, overtaking Austria. So although the filmmaker forgoes using newsreel foot material in the introduction, documentary material is manipulated in the scene when the German takeover is publicly announced. The scene takes place in a cafe where the male protagonist, Prince Court, and it's very important that um, we recognize that he's a prince, that he stops on his way into exile. And he's sort of seen as the figure who, uh, the Austrian figurehead who needs to be saved so that he can come back and save Austria. In the scene, an employee interrupts the orchestra playing, couples dancing, and lively conversations for an important speech, which is going to be broadcast. And I'm gonna play this um, sequence and you'll note that the disembodied voice on the radio is never identified. Ladies and gentlemen, a message of great importance is being broadcast. People of Austria, today we are faced with a critical situation. The government of the German Reich has presented an ultimatum with a fixed time limit demanding our immediate surrender. In the event of refusal, it is intended that German troops shall march into Austria within the hour. I state before the world, we bend to violence. In the face of invasion, we have ordered our army to withdraw without resistance. And so, I take my leave of the Austrian people with the heartfelt wish God help Austria. Austria is dead. Oh, Austria. <laughs> Where 
Joá. So um, you may have recognized the speech. It was an abridged version of Chancellor Kortschusnik's um, speech. The blue on the, um, the slide shows basically what was paralleled in the film, and the white is what was left out. Um, it was slightly but significantly reworked to shrub Austria's victimhood and make the events more understandable to American audiences. While the speech in the film captures much of the original, the omissions and revisions gloss over Austria's internal politics and strengthen the, uh, the film's repeated implied claim of Austria as a monarchy and an unwitting victim. The speech contains no mention that there is a federal president, ignoring the fact that Austria is no longer a monarchy. The dropped reference to German blood glosses over the loss of national identity in the wake of the dissolution of the monarchy, and it glosses over the tie between German Germans and ethnic Germans in Austria. The fact that the speaker is not identified is also significant. As the speech is delivered, the entire crowd at the cafe stands solemnly at attention. Among the group, um, and we saw the camera focusing on him, among the group as the speech is delivered, um, we see Professor Keller, who is a cross between the Austro-fascist cabinet member Guido Sernato and Kurt Schusnick, Austria's last chancellor. It is he who has the final word. At the end of the broadcast, he mournfully pronounces, Austria is dead, our Austria. However, he doesn't elaborate on any further on um, what Austria. And maybe um, it's perhaps the audience members did ask what Austria, but, and we don't have to wait very long to, for the answer. When the emperor's hymn, the Kaiser hymn is played over the radio immediately after the speech, this unofficial national anthem implies that Austria is still a monarchy, and it may be the emperor bidding his country farewell. And although the rendering of these events woefully miss um, the mark, the events echo aspects of a fractured Austrian history shown in a March of Time featurette, which was um, from April 1938, which was shown in all the theaters, and in newspaper articles reporting on Otto von Habsburg in 1941. So but I'm going to take a jump now into um, the, the last chapter I want to talk about, which is cross-cultural encounters of the imminent, intimate kind. In this chapter, I argue that when Americans travel to Austria in these films, personal traits and actions assume symbolic meanings that stand out most sharply in cross-cultural romantic encounters. In four Paramount comedies, the Americans' foreign adventures and cross-cultural romances result in humorous situations that offer more direct commentary on topical issues than Hollywood's other uh, Austrian films. The filmmakers mobilize cliches and stereotypes that highlight supposedly different national um, traits to weigh in on ever-changing historical um, contexts, including the depression in evenings for sale, the rise of fascism in Europe and the entering and the ensuing refugee crisis in Champagne Waltz, and in the post uh, films made after World War II, in the Emperor Waltz comments on World War II and genocide, and in A Breath of Scandal, um, a sort of subtext about the Cold War. But I'd like us to travel back in time to 1948. As strange as it may seem, Imperial Austria and a cross cultural love affair offered narrative possibilities that post-war Austria did not. Billy Wilder's The Emperor Waltz takes pot shots at anti-Americanism, European snobbery, and the National Socialist racist policies. So in this lighthearted uh, film with music, as Wilder called it, the American phonograph salesman, Virtual Smith, played by Bing Crosby, travels to Austria-Hungary with his mongrel dog, Buttons. And the enterprising Smith thinks that he, if he can sell the emperor a phonograph, this new invention, all of Austria will. However, things do not quite work out as expected. When he meets Countess Johanna Franziska Augusta von Stolzenberg Stolzenberg, who is every bit as proud as her name Stolzenberg suggests, the blue blood, along with her poodle, Scheherazade, um, insult the red-blooded American and his dog. Later, both couples, um, the dog couples and the humans, toss differences aside and fall for each other, but not without some lessons for the celluloid Austrians and um, commentary on their behavior. In this turn of the century setting, the film debunks um, the myth of Austrians' innocence. 
Um, Billy Wilder and his co-writer Brackett tied the cross-cultural encounter of the humans and their four-legged, uh, four-footed companions to questions of national identity, class, and racial purity. And in doing so, exposed the country as re resistant to change and ultimately morally corrupt. As representatives of their country, Virgil and Johanna and their dogs are tied to particular discourses on national identity. Whereas the Austrian female is connected to prejudice and snobbery and a group of people who consider themselves superior to Americans, the less pedigreed American counters with strength exhibited in his simplicity, his flexibility, his defense of mixed blood and his moral strength. In this final scene that I'm gonna show, um, the emperor, his chamberlain, Johanna Franziska, and Johanna Franziska's father have been waiting outside the delivery room in anticipation of the birth of Scheherazade's puppies. When Scheherazade gives birth to the three puppies, it's immediately clear that the father of the puppies was not the emperor's dog, but the American mongrel Puttons. To keep this from the emperor, Johanna's, fa Johanna's father takes matters into his own hands, as we'll see in um, this next clip. And I want you to, um, you may have to turn up the sound just a little, but see how many times you can hear the word orders. So th um, this passionate speech with the use of the dogs to point to and condemn Nazi genocide, as well as the orders that were given, this, um, this stands out in contrast to the overall lighter tone of the film. And it certainly um, comes as quite a surprise. But Wilder's knowledge of Austria would have made him skeptical of the victim narrative. And moreover, he was well aware of the death camps and searched, had searched for um, his mother, her fate, who had been murdered. Although contemporary critics do not react to the scene and its reference to recent genocide, um, critics in the past um, few years and Wilder's bi biographers had not failed to see it, um, it connected to Jewish genocide. Most reviewers at the time declared the film as fun, light entertainment, with some occasional remarks on the film's lapses of good taste. Both former reviewers and some very humorous, angry fan, uh, fan letters suggest the American audiences were looking forward, not back, inward, not outward. Let me close my whirlwind tour of Austria's Hollywood um, with a few remarks. Many of the original factors that made Austrian stories attractive for the big screen have evaporated. Nostalgia for the Habsburg monarchy has faded, at least on screen. The German Austrian presence in Hollywood, directors, readers, and writers familiar with Austrian literature, films, and operettas has shrunk. With shifting mores, um, Vienna long ago lost its cachet as the place for racy stories. The old cliches have little or no symbolic value for contemporary audiences. And subsidies, which might make Austria an attractive place to film, have become harder to come by. With shifting global concerns, the little republic of Austria appears to have little, have little import. And with, with rare exception, Austria garners little attention in the news in the United States. Yet, and this is sort of a jump from my um, from where I was leading, I would argue that there are still many untold Austrian stories still waiting to be brought to the screen. So thank you very much. And I will stop the share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's Sorry, I just made a mistake. Um, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for a really fascinating paper and it is really a whirlwind tour so it might be quite difficult to find an angle um, but any everybody would be invited to to, to uh, turn their video and sound on and, and ask a question if 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 there was any or, or write or write one down um, if not I'll ask the first question and oh Bella Rasky please please you you start Bella Hello, uh, I cannot turn on my video because the oh. whole is blocking me. It's okay. I can hear you. Uh, it's okay now? No. Yes. Um, just two questions. Very welcome, Jackie, by the way. Hello. Yeah. From Vienna. Um, just two questions, very short questions. Mm -hmm. One, uh, were these films ever presented in Vienna or in Austria? Mm -hmm. And if, what was the reaction by the Austrian audience or Austrian critique? Mm -hmm. And the second question would be that I have the feeling that the early films, in a way, 
I don't know if you can say that in English, they do not reiterate the victim's thesis of Austria, they kind of pre-iterate ah. it. Mm. Um, so, so it can, and the only film, um, which is a very interesting point in this Emperor Awards, uh, mm. what you said finally, this is the one where obviously the image of Austria changes, maybe, I don't know in these movies. And if you have any kind of uh, explanation for that, that's the two questions. And one remark, it's interesting that the Los Angeles Times, as, as far as I remember, the speech of Schuschnigg ends with, ich verabschiede mich mit einem deutschen Wort und einem Herzenswunsch. And this one also was missing also in the film, but also missing in the Los Angeles translation. So he says, I say farewell with a German word or whatever. Just a remark, it was interesting to see. Okay, thank you again for... Uh, yeah. Wonderful. It's good to, to hear you, Bella. So yeah. um, the, ah, oh, there you are. Yeah. So films in Austria, the, many of them had been shown. And um, the earlier ones, there would have been a break in, um, you know, after 41 and 40 um, when they they weren't in, exported. But um, the, the Emperor Waltz was shown and it received very positive reviews in Vienna. I forget what, um, what newspaper it was, but it was seen as sort of propagating this very positive picture of Austria, which to when I see the film just really surprises me. Plus the fact that the contemporary um, viewers in the United States, the reviewers missed that totally. And the, the fans were only upset. Like one woman said she took her grandson to the film and it was the dirtiest film she had ever seen. Um, because of the connection of dogs and um, marriage or, um, and so that was, they were more upset about that. But a lot of the films were shown in um, the, starting with the earliest ones, um, with the, the Stroheim films. Um, and then, okay, your second question, oh my gosh. Um, can you remind me though, my, my mind is like. The pre-reiterating. Ah, pre yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, so when I was sort of redoing um, my talk and I was talking about them challenging, I first said challenging the victim status and I was having problems with that because it was like, but it wasn't really a declared thing. So I think you're right in sort of this pre setting it up before the fact. And when you see, um, I wish I had had time to show this March of Time um, reel because it um, first shows talks about the emperor as being the bulwark against um, the East. And, um, and that he's the doddering old emperor that Hitler despises. And I was thinking, well, if Hitler despised him, Hollywood sure loved him for, um, for using him as this better um, German. Um, and I would, in the other two, the Anschluss comes up in so few films. I mean, in this one, it's really drastic. But in um, once in the um, so ends our night. It's very clear that the Austrians welcomed it. They they use um, footage, as does um, the Once Upon a Honeymoon, which is a very funny um, comedy with serious angles. But they also both of them use footage, where the, with the welcoming crowds. The um, the two the two that were made post Anschluss, um, the above suspicion shows an American couple who just got married going to, uh, going to Austria or post Anschluss Austria as spies. And the strange death of Adolf Hitler, sh um, which really is very strange, has this person who can totally can imitate Hitler being captured and then um, through cosmetic surgery becomes a double. And his wife has been told that he's dead. His wife, um, tries to assassinate Hitler, but she actually assassinates her husband and gets shot. So that's, um, but again, in those two films, they really don't deal with the, the, the victim narrative or setting Austria up as a victim. It's more um, the idea that this should be resisted. The, um, and there's a big change with um, World War um, II. I mean, the, um, and that was in my chapter on the um, Austrian American romances, the two, that were made before the war have the Americans learning something from the Austrians. It's they who can learn something from the Austrians where in the uh, both Billy Wilder's film and um, Kurtish's A Breath of Scandal, it's the, the Austrians who are very corrupt. But um, I don't know if um, there's one scene that I like to show sometimes from a um, Indiana Jones movie where Indiana Jones and his father are tied up and the um, 
the Austrian Nazi, who's a woman, a very attractive woman, um, comes to say goodbye and gives him a long kiss and said, this is how Austrians say goodbye. And then the German with the billy club comes up and bats him on the head and says, this is how Germans say goodbye. And I would see that as sort of emblematic for how Austria and Germany have been portrayed in Hollywood films. Thank you. I think Alison had a question. Are you still <laughs> up for it, Alison? Hi. Hi, Jackie. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Ooh, yeah. Good. Hi. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it would be so fabulous to have some so days on this and viewings and, you know, really enjoy ourselves more. Thank you very much for uh, giving us some insights. Um, so I, I, I've, I've got three little things. Feel free to ignore or choose. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what nuance goes into any of these films and actually, um, you know, def defining Austria, you know, <laughs> which Austria, which version of Austria, which geographical, you know, iteration of Austrianness are, are we talking about and and whether there's any uh you know does that feature because of course as we know it's it's been a very different sort of land mass <laughs> through the uh, centuries or, or decades um indeed and uh the hiatus was interesting the last films on your on your list um I think we go from 96 to 2005 you know maybe you'd like to um theorize on on why mm -hmm. <laughs> um why that big gap um and then just to say that uh that lieu de memoir that the hofburg uh, balcony that that featured on your slides um because of course that's that's come up so many times in various forms and and i don't know whether you know the uh, uh walter wippersberg film called mm -hmm. die wahrheit über österreich oder um wie man uns belogen hat, um, where it, it features with uh, a, a documentary presenter saying, look how they, look how they, um, it's tongue in cheek, of course, look how they cheated us. Um, these films that were purportedly Adolf Hitler greeting the masses are actually a Taube, um opera singer presentation, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> which yeah. has been stolen and, you know, sort of, early day photoshopped to make us believe that these are the Austrians greeting Adolf Hitler. So that's a funny little moment for you to uh, uh, for you to find or I'll, I'll send you a, a link. <laughs> um, hmm, the, the idea of nuance in these Austrian films is um, a, a funny question, um, particularly I would say um, yes and no. And I mean, even if you look at they dare not love as far as craziness. I mean, you notice the orchestra were wearing lederhosen. And it's like, that's that sort of, that's a very um, sort of a bizarre um, sort of juxtaposition. I would say the films that might be the most nuanced would be um, Erich von Stroheim's films, where I think that he has been interpreted as being, they have been seen as so nostalgic, but I think in so many ways, he's actually um, criticizing that nostalgia and trying to show a more varied Vienna at the same time that he's trying to, he's presenting himself as a nostalgic um, and hmm, other films. Uh, um, I guess, you know, what I was wondering about is, is, you know, exactly where, what is Austria? Oh, you know, is it, is um, it Austria, Hungary, you mentioned him obviously in one yeah. of the films um, and, and famously, of course, as we all know, the sound of music gets so much wrong in terms yeah. of, you know, the geography of that particular yeah. corner of, of Austria. But uh, may, maybe it's just an amorphous. It, it's not really a, a geographical place, is it? It's an idea, Austria. It's, it's, but I mean, so there are a series of films that um, just say they're set in Austria. And I think because Austria or, or Vienna, actually more, um, most of the films are set in Vienna. And Vienna has a certain cachet about it. Like um, the, the, the an early film that Lubitsch's film, The Marriage Circle, was originally set in the play in Berlin, but they set the film in Vienna because I think Vienna has a different cachet than Berlin. Um, and there are a few films that are set outside of the present Austrian border, like the the Franz Schubert um, auto, the biopic New Wine has him first going to Hungary where he finds his love that he then gives up. Um, and there are a couple, but very few actually 
are outside of present day Austria, although there is an emperor and it would be, you know, Austria, Hungary. There are, I'm, I mean, the sound of music is the uh, is one of the few that's set outside of Vienna. There's also the Salzburg connection um, and then some of the, the action films, but um, Vienna certainly predominates. Um, the hiatus, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Austria just sort of almost fell off the, the cinematic um, map after um, the 60s. And when you compare that with the films from the 20s and the 30s, where there are like um, so many, and a lot of them are um, sort of mu musicals, or they say it's in Vienna, and again, it's this cachet that Vienna has. But Vienna seems to really lose, and Vienna and Austria seems to lose that cachet. Um, and again, these, um, this idea, this nostalgia seems to lose um, its currency in the United States, although um, it's, you know, there's, it's may be displaced and put on other, other topics. Um, and I, I mean, when I think there have been some art films that have been set in um, Vienna and then the BBC production of the, um, the, the Klimt picture being, um, and I think they've been popular. I mean, they were showed in American, um, in mainstream cinemas here, but it's, it's really um, frustrating. I mean, for me, it's frustrating because as I said, I still think there are a lot of um, great stories out there, but there, um, but they, some of them have then Austrian stories been put in other contexts, like um, the Eyes Wide Shut, which was the, the, nice. the schnitzel that was put in New York. Um, and then there was one that was like, um, La Ronde, the schnitzler that was set in all around the world, mm -hmm. sort of this um, hands around. So don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Well, Thank you. Fascinating. You need yeah. volumes two, three, four, and five. Yeah. Well, there are British films out there that I, um, like I was telling, I, I, had, I had found a list of like 30 mm. films set in, um, British films set in Austria, which I mm. think would be a great topic. If that, no, if nobody else wants to speak, I, I, I just wanted to say to this question of what Austria, that um, of course this is in the past. I mean, there were many emigrants who were still born in the monarchy and they have this nostalgic view, but there is one transition in the emperor walls, which was, I saw it as a child. It was called Ich küsse ihre Hand, Madame, in the uh, German, in the uh, you know, dubbed version. And there's this transition from the walls in Vienna and the sort of swiping transition to the Tyrolean mountains. And I think of the period then until the sound of music, this is a very powerful image of Austria as I grew up there, even though it was not my experience, it forms your idea of your own country, yeah. you know, the walls and the mountains, even though it wasn't me, this is what sort of structures your mind as, as your first association. So it's very interesting how film, and not just American, but also other film, forms these very strong images that are quite hard to debunk, even if one grows up there oneself. And that's a very funny sequence, too, because first, it's, of course, it's not Austria, but there's a scene where Bing Crosby is singing, and really, the hills are alive. They answer him in yeah. echo. So it's, it's hilarious. Sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah. And sort of funny anticipation yeah. of the hills are alive. I mean, it's a such an interesting film because I did not understand anything about the puppies when I saw it as a young person. And then I read about Billy Wilder that he's actually seen the Konzentrationslager and was there. And he came back and was devastated. And he said, I want to make a funny film now, you know, but then there's all this very wild arrest, really sharp mm -hmm. allusion there, which I don't know who picked it up, fellow emigrants, but maybe not the American audience. Um, maybe I don't know. I mean, even in the names that he um, comes up with and- um... Stolzenberg, Stolzenberg. <laughs> And then Leonard Helenia, the father. I mean, it's, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. there's a lot there. Yeah, no, it's 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 incredibly interesting. And also the other film you showed, The Great Walls, the original stories actually by Vicky Baum. Mm, yes, the yeah. interest mm. of mine. Yeah. Mm. Um, any Alan Price? Would you like yeah, to? Say yes, something? I'd just like to talk about two films later on: uh, Preminger's The Cardinal, mm -hmm. and. Um, John Huston's Freud, 
Mm-hmm. What I've always admired about Prime Minister, a wonderful organiser, organiser of crowd scenes in his films. Mm-hmm. Almost you get this sense of witness to history with his films, like mm-hmm. Exodus and The Cardinal. And I, I found that very fascinating, the way Vienna was used wonderfully well, I thought, actually, the scene where the Nazis are breaking up uh, a crowd a demonstration, actually, in the film. Uh, and I thought there was an incredibly vivid sense of Austria at that moment of what does it do in terms of its relations with Nazi yeah. Germany. So, and then coming back to something like Freud's, um, sorry, Houston's film on Freud, I was just wondering how many biopics that have ever been made about Freud were actually set in Vienna, because Houston did film in Vienna, and then of course there was shoot studio stuff, presumably in America yeah. and so on. And I think the Freud film is very interesting because it's almost shot like a film noir, which yeah. reminds you of something like The Third Map. I think it's a marvellous film and very underrated, actually. You know, uh, I'm just wondering about that sort of, you know, the cr- crossover, like The Third Man, and you think of, you know, the, the noir look of Freud and so on. And, um, and that links back to people like Schnitzler and those views of, of Vienna in, in the golden age of Vienna and, and sense of the 1900s and so on. Um, that the, these, I think both Preminger and um, Houston were using Vienna in a way that was not the usual association with glorious scenery, yeah. and Walt Strauss, uh, uh, Str- uh, Walters by Strauss, and so on. And in a sense, and in a way, it was very interesting those two films uh, showed you how underused Vienna was as well. There's so many other stories you could say about Vienna, uh, oh, sorry, Austria. And of course, now there's very little done, of course, you know. And um, I, so I actually have a chapter where I compare the um, Cardinal and the the Sound of Music and how they, uh, the same uh, historical event for very different messages and how, I mean, in, in, in the Cardinal, I mean, Preminger was dealing with so many topical issues yes. ranging from, I mean, starting with abortion up to totalitarianism. And his the two scenes set in, or the two sequences set in Vienna are um, very interesting, particularly the one after the Anschluss and where he deals with events that really did happen yes. that, um, I mean, he's criticized by some film critics because he compra- compacts what happened in months in days. Yes. But I think it is very, um, very impressive. And when I haven't I've seen the Freud a couple of times and I remember first trying to figure out where was, where was it Vienna because it is so dark. Mm. I haven't thought of it in terms of noir, but um, I'd have to, to do that. And the, the only other American Freud film that I can think of right away is uh, where Freud comes up is in the, the seventh percent solution where Freud and Sigmund, uh, where Freud and um, Sherlock Holmes meet. But that's, of course, um, a sh- sort of a spiel film. So. Sure. Yes. Yes. OK, thank you. I mean, of course. It, it was generational that there were so many films and they're dwindling now, apart from other structural reasons. But uh, it's it's so fascinating to think that this huge group of people chucked out of Austria, established themselves and were able to establish this um, discourse. And, mm-hmm. and isn't it? I mean, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. I mean, I'd love to hear more about you on, on Silencer as well, because on Stroheim, I think, is marvellous because... I mean, you know, his films are often because of, you know, being decadent, but they are very critical of the high upper class decadence yeah. and so on. You know, and they were very risque, of course, in their day, you know, yeah. filming orgies and things like this and so on. But they're marvelously subtle to watch. I mean, you know, it gets psychology and character so well, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Stroheim, you think, God, what a neglected figure Stroheim is really, you know, now as <laughs> well. Yeah. I think Christian Cagnelli raised his hand and we have time for just one more question because we need to let Jackie yeah. go. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Christian, please. Good evening. Hi. Um, this might not be a question, but maybe some additional information because Bella asked about um, the films being shown in Austria. When The Great Waltz was shown in Austria in 1949, it met with furious, hostile response from the left, from the right, and it, in, in a way it echoed the, um, I want to read just one line from the wonderful review of Harry Kahn in the Pariser Tageszeitung of 1939, which was echoed in the, in the Austrian papers later on. Just a moment, this is in German, Harry Kahn wrote in 49, um, it's in German, 
Die Atmosphäre, in der sich das Ganze bewegt, schmeckt mehr nach der Kulissenluft von Calvo City als nach dem Gebirgswind, der von Semmering und Rax her durch die Gassen auf der Wieden weht. <lacht> uh, which is <lacht> kind of wonderful. And this was echoed in the Arbeiterzeitung 1949, where the film was considered a sacrilege. This is sacrilegious, what, the, what this Hollywood confectionaries did to our Vienna. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's interesting. I, 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 um, an exile who had to flee Vienna in 38 wrote to me how he saw, or told me how he saw it in um, South America and how homesick he was upon seeing it. And evidently it was very popular with the Russians. And that's sort of what, when they came to Vienna, that's what they expected. So it's interesting, the, the reception, the varied reception of these films. Thank you. That's really interesting. I mean, it was obviously also the case with the sound of music, perhaps with more, uh, <laughs> right? But <laughs> Yeah, it, it is all so fascinating, Jackie, but I think you, I mean, you gave us generously of your time and it is uh, time to, to call a close to this. Thank you ever so much and thank you for, for coming and asking questions. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you and, and um, yeah. all the, the um, audience.